Let's wait until Steve resets the tripod over there. <laughs> We're okay now. Hang on, it's not going down. So you can tell this is live and not really live. Is it safe? Yeah, I think so. Sure enough. I'm not standing right next to that. Um, I'd like to talk about your, your life and career in general terms. Would you? <laughs> you come from Dutch English parentage and you got the acting bug quite early on in life, didn't you? Yes. Because you were in something when you were 11 years old. Yes, but it actually, I wrote and directed and, and, and starred in my own play when I was nine. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. So you've always been, had this creative... Yeah. Where does that come from? Do you have uh, some uh, else in your family who's artistic or...? Oh yes, oh yes. In fact, when I'm painting, I have all these ghosts behind me. My father saying, no, no, don't put a shadow in there, no. My grandfather was a painter, my father was a painter. And my mother would have been an actress, only um, she wasn't allowed to by her parents. Uh, so, so it's all in the genes. So this is interesting. So the, the change from actress to, to painter isn't so unusual, no, really, no. if you think of it in that term. No, you're, I, you're, I, I definitely, it's run... You it's know, your destiny in some way. ways, maybe. Yes. Um, you, you went to a children's drama school called, I think, the Arts Education. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you left for four years. You've done your co-work, have yes, you? Yes, I have. <laughs> um, and while you were there, you did a lot of uh, children's TV and film. Yes. Something with uh, Hugh Bennett, didn't you? I think he... Yes, The Prince and the Pauper. There were all these, you know, children's... Children's... I mean, sometimes they weren't children. Sometimes I was bored in and did grown-up things, but mostly there were children's series and serial, serials and things like this. And, yes, how, why, how do you know about Harold Bennett? Because I don't know what's happened to him. Is he still working? He, well, he did that, that lovely thing called Shelley on TV, which is absolutely brilliant, I think. Uh -huh. It was very witty. Uh -huh. But I haven't seen him anything for ages. No. The no, last time I saw him something was, um, must have been four or five, even longer, six years ago, maybe. The last time I worked with him was a lot longer than that. <laughs> Now, yeah. you, following, following the Arts Educational, you, you were enrolled in RADA. I did. But you were chucked out of RADA. It was terrible, because I got, I got this scholarship. I got the biggest scholarship, you know, where your, everything is paid for, which was, you know, food and accommodation and everything. And so what I did you do to get chucked out? I just, <laughs> I was just wild, I think. I was just wild, and, um, and I argued. And, um, and I questioned, because in those days, I think it was a little bit kind of stayed, and things were done as they'd always been done. And so I was questioning, why are they done like this? Why, why do we, you know, why? And so they didn't like me, so they, yeah, so I got kicked out. I remember my mother coming on the day, you know, when they'd sent my papers to me, saying, right, she's, this is it, we're not having her anymore. We should say, right, well, you've buggered that up, now what are you going to do then? <laughs> so I went back to work, I just called up my agent and said, oops, um, excuse me, I need some work now. So I just went back into work again. You're in good company. Sir John Gilgit was chucked out, um, Charles Lawton was thrown out. Was he? And even John Pertwee. Oh, well, there he was. So the rebels. Perhaps it's a good thing to be thrown out, maybe. It's a band of rebels. <laughs> and they've had they good careers <laughs> since then, so uh, but it's, it's interesting. Yes. You acted in uh, a film in '65, I think it was called The uh, Pleasure Girls. Yeah. With Mark Eden yeah. and Ian McShane. Ian McShane. Was that your first? And Francesca Annis. Really? Yeah, she was. Yeah. Was that your first sort of proper adult role as such, leaving mm. Rada or? No. No, because I'd made some movies before and I can't remember the names of them. But because um, the first movie that I did when I was 11, that was a grown-up movie too. It wasn't just for kids, but we were kids in it. Um, so no, it wasn't. And I'd done Some People, which was with Kenneth Moore. Mm. Um, so, and, but The Pleasure Girls was, it was just terrible. It was just terrible. It was just awful. It was so embarrassing. Because um, there we were all, do, you know, we'd got the part and we were all busy working in it. And Clive Donner was directing, you see. Good director. And good director, which was one of the reasons I'd worked with him on some people before, so it was good to be working mm. with him. And then what happened was that um, the producers came down on the set and they said, no, no, we're not going to be able to sell it, not enough sex. So we've got to make it much more. So then they re they turned over the script. In the middle of making it? In the it, middle of making they it. They changed the script. So then, you know, scenes that had taken place sort of outside a telephone box were put in bed for no reason at all, you know, just... 
And Clive actually walked out and said, I'm not having anything to do with this. And, and so somebody had sent me a copy, and I, I saw it for the first time some months ago. That must be scary. And uh, <laughs> I noticed that there was a completely different name for the director, and it's a terrible film. So he's had his name actually removed from the he's credits then entirely. Credits, yeah. Yeah, which I, all of which I didn't know. So, you know you it's just not Alan know. Smithy now, is it, or something? Uh, no, Jerry, Jerry, I can't remember, but he wrote and directed and produced it, so, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, following on from there, you, you eventually was cast as Polly. How did that come about? Did, did Neil Innes um, get the approach from your agent? Or? Yes, yes, you know, just, you know, you're busy with me. I was always busy you know, doing my life with my children and, and then the agent's calling up to say, right, an interview for Doctor Who at the BBC. Whoa, Doctor Who, that would be fun, because, you know, because it had only been running a couple of years, but it was very much part of everybody's lives, you know, Saturday afternoon, five o'clock, everybody was plugged in, you know. Yes. And my husband had been in it too. A ritual, so. wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, it was a ritual, Saturday afternoon ritual. So, um, so, you know, so that was like, oh, wow, well, that would be fun. And then, you know, it's interesting now because we have all the information, but I didn't know because I didn't know how many other people, I didn't know how many thousands of people had been interviewed for the, for the part. If I'd known, I probably would have been much more nervous, but I just went toddling in and, you know, did, did my best with what they gave me. And, and then you go home and then you wait. You know, and you wait and the phone is going, oh, it's you, I thought it was my agent, and hello, hello, and then finally the agent called up and said, okay, you've got that. I said, oh, all right, you know, this is good, yeah. And you were contracted for a, for a whole year, weren't you yes. initially, I think? Yes, yes. You had the option, yes. perhaps, to go beyond that if you wanted they to. Didn't, they didn't give us the option at that point. They gave us the option after um, the completion of, before, before the last four, before that last set of series, and I can't remember what it was called. What was the last four? What was the last four? Well, the, the, last, uh, the last one would have been uh, the Faceless yeah, ones. The Faceless ones. The faceless ones. Then they came and they said, and this is very interesting, because and now I have complete freedom to say whatever I like, because Mike's upstairs. Because <laughs> so, he always said, they came and said, that's it, you've got the chop. And I don't remember that. I remember them coming to me and saying, do you want to go on? Do you want to do another whole year? And, and I thought, I'd better not, because if I do, I'll get stuck in with the security of it. Yes, and, and the task then it would be like trying to escape the Coronation Street, and, you know, and then that would be my life, would be Doctor Who. So I said, no, I think I'll stop now. And, um, and then I was out of work for six months. Well, that happens that leaving a, a major yeah. series, doesn't it? Yeah. When, you, when you joined the role, though, as Polly, were you aware that William Hartnell was going to be leaving at some stage? No. So that was a surprise to you, then. Yeah, that was a relief, actually. Because <laughs> he had a sort of a yes. reputation quite a racist, yes. really, wasn't he? Yes, he was a pig. Yeah, he was. And he was you were coming pig. in, he'd obviously been doing this series for, for two, two and a half years or whatever. Yeah. So he was very much it was his oh, series. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's a bit well, of a major He had his own chair with Bill Hartnell written on and everything. So he was um, on his chair. Oh, yeah. So then... Um, so no one could sit in his chair. Then. No, and one time, you know, you know, the chair is there, and we're taking a break, and so I sat in his chair. And then he didn't, he didn't come straight to you. He would say to the to the to the stage manager, or whatever, just would you mind? And then she'd say, "You're sitting in Bill's chair." And, oh, I'm sorry. I said, "Pardon me." So then I had a chair, and Mike had a chair. All so your legs on. Yeah. So my chair said, oh. "Annika wheels on the back," and I put and I wrote underneath. And anybody else who'd like to have a sit down. <laughs> Just, oh, you know, you're up your bum. <laughs> so, working with Bill Hartner, was it, uh, was it a bit of a strain then? It was a strain. It was a strain. He was very, um... Because he, was, he wasn't he too well then, was he, either? Right. He was... No. And he would flip out at the drop of a hat, and it was... So, rehearsals were always, um... Not, you know, mostly we didn't have, we, we didn't have nearly as much fun, you know, um, like when Pat came on, then the whole thing lightened up, and then we were having tremendous fun and great practical jokes and, and great giggles, and you know, and it was smashing. It was just smashing. You did some very nasty things to Pat, didn't you? I think sort of to tease him. Mm -hmm. See, we didn't. We didn't. Um, it was. It was funny because I mean, he was busy playing jokes on everybody, but if you played one back on him, he didn't like it at all. He got terribly upset. And then you got upset because you'd upset him. But you, you know, I remember Mike and I thinking, you know, oh, this, this will make him laugh. He'll love this one. You know, it's his birthday. We'll give him what's the most boring thing you could possibly think of? A pair of 
of socks. Great, but we will only give him one. <laughs> you know, we thought this is so funny. And his little face, you know, you go, and so, yeah, so we, yeah, so we dropped all that. Didn't you wear some t-shirts? Yeah, with no, no, we had the t-shirts. That awful slogan. Yes, come, bring back, come back, bring back, no. Bring back Bill Hartnell or something. Come back, Bill Hartnell, always forgiven. He was quite, he was quite, He uh, was upset. Yeah, so I can understand upset. that. Yeah. We thought it was just a giggle. I'm sure a lot of people here want to talk about Doctor Who, so we won't sort of dwell on that too much, but yeah. Um, yeah. working with Troughton must, must have been... Uh, yeah, a dream. A, yes, because he's such a good actor. Yeah. But he wasn't always sort of close, close to the script, really, was he? He had a tendency yeah. to yeah, want yeah. to um, yeah, yeah. develop his own lines. Take off, right? <laughs> that must be very difficult, because obviously as an actress or an actor, you have, you have your, your part... Yes. You, you've learned it very, very well indeed. You know when to come in, yes. and you have a certain. You think, He's that line right now. I'll stop doing, yes. and he completely throws you. Yes, I know, but I like that. You see, because it became more improvisational, and you were much more sort of in the moment, and the magic would happen because it's you know if you're not given your cue, then you have to. It doesn't look rehearsed in that yeah. way, I suppose. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's fresh. So I like that. But they, but they, you no, know, because you know, innocent people, they'd come to, they, they used to stamp on his, on his creativity, saying, "Hey, Pat, now look, come on, all right, boring farts," he'd say, "Come on, what is he? Where is this old boring old script? <laughs> what am I got to say here?" <laughs> his character changed a lot from the early stories because, I mean, he's very much a, a Chaplin-esque kind of character with yes. the old stovepipe hat and, and the recorder. Which towards the end of his reign, he, he sort of uh, he lost phased, those. Didn't did he? he phase that out? Yeah, I mean the soap opera didn't last. Well, it's phased out before you left the series, wasn't it? Yes, really. Yeah. And uh, and the recorder was was hidden by the directors and producers. Wasn't it? Was it? <laughs> his bloody recorder. Oh God! It used to drive us potty because he used to he used to have that thing as a sort of um, if he got in a. It's a prop I mean, to, to yeah. keep him. Yes, yeah. you know, and if he got the hump. He'd just go off in the corner of rehearsals and, and be playing his blooming recorder, you know. So how much, I'm curious to hear you say that, how much of Power of the Daleks then, when he's playing a recorder, how yeah. much of that is him just trying to be him? Oh yeah, absolutely. Most of it was him, you know. Amazing. Yeah. Um, when you eventually left the series, you had this opportunity you, you could have stayed on if you wanted to. Did, did you and Michael Craze actually decide to leave at the same time then? Or could you have stayed on if he... I think, you see, I think that's the thing. I think that they, that I could have stayed on with Fraser. I think that, cause when, cause, because they didn't say to us both, OK, now you're both being phased out. They came to me and said, do you want to go on? And if I'd said yes, I would have, I would have gone on with Fraser. And they phased Michael out. Because mm. suddenly we were, it was a bit unbalanced, because Fraser came on board, and then we had, the, you know, Fraser and Ben, and me. You see, so they would have put Fraser and me together and Faze Michael out, um, but I said no, and so then we both left, mm. and then and then Debbie came in. So then they had the. Your character was very much of the sixties. I mean, she's a very much the King's Road, Dolly Bird type. Mm. We call them the slow ranger, I suppose, today, wouldn't you? Mm. Um, no, no, different. I don't think no, so. No, different. Yeah, I think so. No, not not the, not not a slow ranger because they were. Anyway, never mind. Go on. But, <laughs> The, the series has been criticised many, many times for sort of having those kind of characters. I think it's important because you, you need to have a, an assistant or, or a supporting character who can ask questions. Yeah. Because that's what the series is about. And the Doctor yeah. has to be the one who gets you out of everything. Right. And without yeah. that, I don't think the series... Well, we really... sometimes got the Doctor out of things. Yes, too. indeed. Ah. You, can, you can change it slightly. But yes. it, it always needs to revert back to that, doesn't it? Where the, the assistant is asking... Doctor, what should we do now? Whatever. Yes, of course. Yes, but uh, you see, <clears throat> you see, it was like with with Sophie's character Ace. She was she was a product of her time. Very much, the, very much the eighties. With the leather yes. jacket and stuff, and so Polly. And I think that um, up to that point, the assistants had been more private. I should say this privately, but a bit more frumpy. They were a bit more. Frumpy. Yes, I know what you mean. So I think that they definitely they definitely were looking for somebody who was going to be a kind of twiggy, you know, and who was the sort of, of person the time, of the time. Of the time, in fact, of the right. 60s, yes. That's right. So, I mean, you know, I walked in with skirts up to here, and, you know, they looked, that, she's, she'll be good. <laughs> now, yeah. Michael's now sort of sat in a long with us. We were actually going to have Michael for the first ever uh, event we had here in Crawley. But unfortunately, he was ill, I think, the day before and had to cancel. This is back like two, two years ago. Two years ago. Obviously, yeah. sadly, now we, we can't invite him. But, yes. uh, 
Oh, no, he's here. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you left Doctor Who, you did a number of TV series. <clears throat> you were in the original Railway Children with the TV version, I believe, weren't you? Yes, but that was in 1957. Oh, that well, was after. No, that so was it wasn't the long Jenny Agatha. No, no, no. No, no, I played Jenny Agatha's part. This was a, the, in, the first in version, In the first so BBC. Oh, yeah. I thought it was the one in, in, in the late 60s. No, I got that wrong, obviously. No, no, yeah. Thanks for correcting me on You're that. You're right. Um, you appeared in Armchair Theatre. Yeah. Now, some people here might not know what Armchair Theatre was. It was basically, I think, filmed plays, really, wasn't yes. it? The BBC had the Wednesday play, and this was like the ITV version of it. And they were yes. very, very well produced yes. plays, I think, anyway. Yeah, yeah, they were. Something I wish they, they did today, really. You also appear... Well, the, the, what do they Sorry. call it today? Uh, of course, they don't call it anymore, but... Um, no, never mind. Well, they don't really do plays anymore, do they, on TV? Not, not, as, not as such, anyway. They're, like, they're, they're mini fe feature films, really, aren't yes, they, now? Yeah. As opposed to the actual, you know, yeah, it's, the actual but set. But that sort of developed out of Masterpiece Theatre, that's what they called it in Indeed. the States. They had Masterpiece Theatre, and which was basically the same as Armchair Theatre. You know, that was, that was, it was the sort of the drama of the week. You know, and you had the good actors and you had the good directors. And very good writers as well. Very good writers, they were as good stuff. Yeah. One of the series that I really liked, we were talking about when you arrived, was Strange Reports. Mm. I love that series. It's very rarely shown these days. I think a few episodes appeared on videotape about five years ago, which had long been deleted. Mm. Anthony Quayle is a very good actor. Mm. I've always, I and mean, I was watching Ice Cold and Alex last week with Johnny Mills and yes. you know, Harry Andrews, Sylvia Sims. He outacts everybody off the screen. Yeah. And the difficult part is playing a, a Dutch Afrikaner, which is not an easy part to play, really. And his, what was his accent like? Was it he? was good, I thought. Yes, yeah. but um, I don't know, perhaps I'm wrong in thinking this, you might correct me. Um, I always thought that Anthony Quell, like Patrick Traven, was probably happier doing a supporting role and not being the leading man. Was that, is that true, do you think, or would you say that was... Um... I don't know, because I mean, I, um, in Strange Report, he was... He was the star of the Adam, show. Adam, what's his Strange. Name? Adam Strange, that's right. He was totally happy being in it, so I don't know. I don't know. But a very fine actor. Very fine actor. Very fine actor. And actually, it was it was interesting when we were doing Strange Report because quite often some of the scripts were that we got were really uh, difficult, not particularly good. And so he used to call me up to his dressing room and say, "Oh, Annika, come on in," because Kaz Garros was a complete bonehead, you know. <laughs> he was a very sweet man, but absolute bonehead and a totally non-actor. But he was he was. He was the American money, it, you know, the series would get made if we could have Kaz Garros because the Americans were trying to push him, you see. He never went anywhere because he was very sweet but not very good at acting. Um, so, so Tony and I would get hold of the scripts and he'd say, oh God, what are we going to do with this load? And so then we'd break it down and we tried to make it magic, the two of us. And so a lot of what goes on in Strange Report was actually him and me you know, kind of crossing all the out all the sort of difficult, you know, sort of stilted stuff and to making make it, it more, more accessible, you know, accessible and, and, and funny natural. and you know, yeah. So um, it was fun. It was fun to work together in that way. And then at the end of that, we, again, they did the same thing. You see, they said, um, "Okay, do you want to go on?" At this point, we're going to. We were making it Darling Pinewood, and they said we're going to do the next series, another twenty-six, and but this time we're going to base it from Hollywood. And I said, hang on. Look. So you would have gone to America. I know. But this had was that a option. real turning point in my career, you know, because if I'd gone to Hollywood, God knows what would have happened to me, you know. And, and I, so I went to Tony and said, what are we going to do? Do you want to do this? Are we going to do this? And he said, I don't think I want to go to Hollywood. I said, nor do I. I'm glad you said it because I don't. And he said, I, I think, I said, let's, let's see, what do we want to do here? So we sat in his, in his suite of dressing rooms and he said, I actually would like to take a break because it's been really hard work and I want to take my boat and go down the canals of France and come out in water. And I said, I want to go to the country and grow vegetables. And so that was it. We, we said no. And I said to my agent, I've had enough. I need a break. I, you know, it, was, it was very hard work, Strange Report. Um, you know, getting up at four in the morning and, you know, so it was hard work. And uh, 
yes, it was time for me to actually sort of take a break. So in fact, that's what happened. I you bought a house to... in Norfolk. Is this the time you... Yes. You were married to Michael Goff then, weren't yes. you? So he was making what, The Go-Between, Go -between. which was filmed near Norwich. That's right. So you bought a house That's it. So then that while time. he was filming, I drove around and then I saw this house and fell in love and said, oh, I've got to have this farmhouse. It was so cheap. It was £3,000. <laughs> It's it's incredible buying a house at three thousand yeah. pounds. And then there was a great big field, and they said you could have the field for five hundred. And we thought, do we want the field? Oh, okay, we'll have the field. Thank God we have the field. If we hadn't bought the, bought the field, somebody could have bought, you know. Built it's it. incredible those prices. You, and you, can, well, you can't even buy in, a car for that. In the Myth Makers, I go back there, and um, in my in the Myth Makers tape, and um, and because we we drove past it, and I said to the guys, look, that's where I used to live, and they said. Is anybody there? No, nobody was there. So we climbed over and we went in and filmed in the back. <laughs> the owners weren't there. <laughs> well, I kind of felt, I mean, they're owners now, but really I own this house. This is yes, really my house. It was your, you know. your ex-house. Yeah, yeah. Towards the end of the 70s, you, you went to Belgium, I think. Yes. When you were travelling a lot, weren't you? Went yes. to, and then went to India. Went to India. You don't have to say it like that. Well, went to India. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, a very exotic country to go to. Yeah. I lived them on and off for four years. So, were you acting then, or? Well, I was actually, um, but I hadn't gone there to act. I'd 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 gone there to um, to go and be in this ashram because by then I was on my spiritual search. So I was in this ashram, and um, and then uh, we started to do Shakespeare. We were doing Shakespeare. So we had as an offshoot of the ashram, we had a sort of um, a sort of theatre group that was going to. Um, in a way, advertised the ashram. So then we would. It's a bit like Shakespeare Waller, like the visit of Cambridge. Shakespeare Waller, yes. So it's that kind of thing where you're actually doing it to yes. the to the local towns. And yes, things. yes. So we we toured around India, in these great big marble. That must theaters. be an experience. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was an experience, and we were doing the Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. But you know, the, but the other thing is that in in that ashram, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm becoming a disciple, and I'm just melting into the background and becoming this kind of bland sort of person who didn't know, nobody knew anything. And around the corner of the ashram, somebody said, Psst, are you, were you, you, were you in Doctor Who? It was my favourite programme. <laughs> so there was a whole group of, you know, disciples They'd who were all, you know, Doctor well. Who fans. So, you know, I never could get away from it. <laughs> now, leaving India, you went back to Belgium, I think, initially, yes. first of all. Then yes. you went to... California. And then to Canada. And then to Canada. I was in California for about four years, and um, and then I left there because it's very mad, America. It's very mad. I thought if I don't get out of here quickly, I'm going to become as mad as they are. So, and so then I went north, and because um, you know sort of through contacts, and found this wonderful little island in British Columbia, which is eight miles round, full of crazy artists and um, eagles. You know, ah, it was beautiful, and so I lived there for the next seven years. So there must have been a conscious decision at some time in your life to stop being an actress and to pursue an artistic career. Um, that seed of yes. thought must have formed at some stage, either in India or Belgium or, or wherever. Well, yes. I mean, in a way, um, this, it was an inner search. And then, and then out of that came... Um, in a way, because you see, in a way... Um, to describe this. This is a hobby that you've made into your job, is um, it? Is what, the, the painting? Yes. Well, the painting, I've always done painting. I, even when I was acting, I was painting. I was selling paintings to actors and things. There's all kinds of actors who've got my paintings as well. So I've always done that, you see. That's always been a part and parcel. So that's always been so, something you've done? Absolutely. In your whole life? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, who knows how you... I mean, I don't know. We each of us full are fulfilling our destinies, you know, and you don't know... You don't know who's in charge. I'm, I'm not in charge, you know. <laughs> you also are an interior designer, I think, weren't you? Yeah. Didn't you work yeah. on David Dillon's house or yes. something? Yes, that, that was in London. It was really funny because um, I can tell it now, you see, because he's also gone upstairs. Sadly. Um, um, I've got a great thing from David Dillon, actually. I don't know if I should say this on, on camera. Yeah. Um, it's a bit rude. Anyway, I've got a plaque that I actually was, was given. And um, I worked for Warner Brothers, and he obviously was a Warner Brothers contract uh, star. And yeah. it says, um, it, uh, 
working for Warner Brothers is like fucking a porcupine. It's a thousand pricks against one. <laughs> they I couldn't put it up on the wall, obviously. It worked. Cut that bit out. You can cut that bit out. It's very rude. Right. So uh, I'm sorry about it, everybody. But I have to say it to you. But, uh, anyway, yes. you, you were saying, sorry. Oh, no, well, I did his house. And uh, I mean, one of his houses, because he had lots of them. But um, I, it was just really interesting, because I knew perfectly well. I'd send out, he was living in South France. I'd send out samples of, of wallpaper and stuff. He'd always choose the cheapest. This man was rich, you know, he was rich. He would always choose the cheapest. He had me schlepping around these these markets to go and find the cheapest washing machine and the cheapest, you know. Oh my God, it's so strange, it. isn't it? I know. When someone like him could afford and anything. That's how they get rich, you know, he's <laughs> so mean with it. And he's <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. But then on the island in Canada, I also was doing. Uh, as it were, you know, designing people's houses and stuff. So, um, and painting them. I was doing decorative art and stuff. So, in fact, you know, when it came time for me to leave, they said, "Well, you have to go because you've painted everything on this island. There's nothing left for you to paint." You know. Yeah. It's important, I suppose, for an artist. To, your surroundings are very important where you, where you yeah. live because it, yeah. the creative juices have to flow. You have to feel yeah. comfortable. Well, you know, this is the interesting thing, you see, because in a way. I, I always remember saying, uh, you know, actually, it started then, was my my need to come back to the English landscape, because I love it. And I used to say, I don't like these pointy trees, you know, they're all pointy trees. I like the lovely soft oaks of England. And then it, in that portfolio, there's one picture that I did, which is so weird when you look at, you know, it's like who's in charge of one's life. I did this picture of this ruined castle and the mists and this kind of medieval woman on a horse riding towards the castle and that was like years before I got to living now where I live which is but Corfe Castle. So and it's very similar obviously. Yes, yes there's landscape. the ruined castle. There's so it's the almost mists. like you're I know, I didn't something know. that you might have. That's right and I didn't know it. Oh. So I always find that that picture is very interesting actually. So do you, yeah. uh, do you feel that your career as an actress now has changed? You're now an artist. And I'm now an artist. I mean the thing is I mean, I could call an actress an artist anyway, in a certain respect. I mean, it's, it's a form of art, isn't it? Yeah. I'm a painter, then. <laughs> well, you feel, I mean, like, in a way, if you're an actress, you are, you're, you're painting a canvas with your performance, aren't you, to yeah. a certain extent. So, yeah. painting a, or, or a pastel or whatever... On this is very deep, now well, then. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. I was just thinking that. Yeah, it's good. That train of thought. Yes, it's good. I think yeah. we'll open this up to people from the audience now. Does anybody want to ask Annika a question, Doctor Who, or art, or anything? Anything. Ask me anything. <laughs> the meaning of life. Anything you want. <laughs> if I knew that. And we've got a question. <laughs> we'll go home. When Sylvester was doing his filming in Canada for the movie, yeah. he met up on the little tape they were doing. How did that come about? Yeah. Yes, yes, because um, at that time I had a, I was running a sort of gallery place in Vancouver and um, I think I would got some blurb on the wall and this lovely black actress came in and she said, you were in Doctor Who, you know they're making a Doctor Who movie here in Vancouver. I said, they can't, they haven't told me. <laughs> this is my town and my movie, you know, what are you doing? So then, so I said, oh, you know, um, Get me, get me the, get me the telephone number of the of the production company that are doing it because I must find out who's, you know, who's doing it and stuff like that. So then, um, and I wanted to be in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I called up and um, I found out the name of the director. What was his name? Jeffrey. Oh, Jeffrey it? Sachs. Yes, that's Jeffrey right, Sachs. Yeah. So I got the name of the director and I had the production company and I said then. It's, you know, you really know, I mean, I'm still only Annika, and I mean, you know, it's scary, so, because I'm going to do a wheeze, so I call up, because, you know, you're going to get turned away, and so, you know, thing. but, um, so I called up, and I said, um, they said, uh, you know, Doctor Who movie, or whatever it was, uh, production office, I said, um, yes, um, is Jeffrey there? They said, oh, yeah, hang on a sec, who is it? <laughs> I said, oh, um, it's Annika. I said, oh, okay, well, right -o. Then he came on the phone, and he said, I'm sorry, do, do I know you? I said, it's Annika Williams, and uh, a long time ago I used to be in the series, and I just wondered if you needed anybody, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he was very, I and mean, I'm sweating bricks, you know, doing this. <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, Annika, that's really nice of you to contact us, and um, 
I know that Sylph would like to, to, um, to, to, you know, can you leave your phone number for But uh, we're not, it's, you know, we, we're in the middle of production. We, we're not doing it like we can. We, I said, listen, I'll do anything. I'll come and sweep the floor. I just yeah, want to yeah. be a part of it. And so, so then Sylph called up and said, we'll come down. I'll bring Paul. We'll come down to your shop. And then Bill Baggs was there, and he said, well, we'll film in your shop, and we'll take you out to lunch and stuff. So I, and then I went and had a lovely, um, the last night, which was when, which was when Sylph got, was Sylph, was, he was pissed out of his head. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was the last night, he was leaving, it was the last night of the movie, and we all went out for a lovely dinner, I think. And then we went to this Irish bar, all this music was going on. And then Sylph was pissed out of his head. And then he was playing the spoons. You heard the story, I've told this before. And he was he could play the spoons. Have you seen him do that? He was mm. fantastic. So um, He's quite gifted, isn't he? Quite gifted. So he was sitting there. How did it happen? And um, and he said, oh, blah, blah, blah. he's playing his spoons, <laughs> like this. And suddenly and there's this guy behind him, and I don't know how it happened, but there is this huge man with a sort of shaven off head and about you know four foot wide and about sort of ten foot high I mean it's an enormous monster and Sylph sees these knees and he starts playing up these knees and <laughs> the guy I'm sitting with this is happening here and I don't know who I'm sitting with here Bill Baggs or something we're both going oh my god almighty because this man looked as though he could just you kill know, somebody yeah. kill him <laughs> swat him like a little spy you know and uh and we don't know how to stop him because you, you can't stop him because he's this is what he's doing. <laughs> and so then he stands up, it gets worse, and he goes up the guy's body and he gets to the face and he gives him a little smile and this huge enormous monster just completely melted into the <laughs> Oh god. So and then we left there and we took him back to the hotel, Sutton Place Hotel, which is where all the actors stay, and it was like three o'clock in the morning. I'm completely wiped because I'm an early bed person. Um, and uh, we left him, he fell out of the car the taxi and he'd met up with all the X-Files people and he was just, we left him three blocks away, talking away, waving his arms and you know, he was having such a good time. No, it was lovely. Any other questions? Thank you for that question, that was um, a good one because I could talk a lot about it. What was your favourite story that you appeared in? Um, Doctor well, Who you're talking about? In Doctor Who. I think, I know Mike and I always used to say when we were asked this question that we liked the historical ones. So we liked um, the, um, the Highlanders, and we loved the smugglers. The smugglers, we loved that because it was a great story, and it was fun for us to go on location. Because otherwise, the location people were isn't like, like yeah. Gatwick Airport, mm. you know, <laughs> up the road. Um, so, so it was lovely to go to Cornwall, you know. And uh, it's so awful, you see. But all the stories we tell are all, all sort of largely focused around drinking. <laughs> you know, there was a very good pub down there where we stayed near Penzance, you know. And uh, even though it was Bill Hartnell, you know, on board, we did have fun. Even so though it was Bill Hartnell. Even though it was Bill Hartnell, because <laughs> as soon as Pat came on, it was always fun. But, but um, no, we loved the smugglers in particular. And uh, it's been quite fun to watch those, you know, telly, telly thingies. It was a cool place to existing all, unfortunately. Yes, yes. You mean where the soundtrack has had the yes. pictures put to it? Yes, so you can actually get an idea. Clever idea, that. And Paul Whitson Jones. And I always remember when they're doing some hanging, they're hanging the men, and they, they say something. The actor who says, I can't remember his name, he says, Take the stream! <laughs> That's from the Highlanders, <laughs> I think, isn't it? Oh, is that the, yeah, in the Highlanders? Mm -hmm. All right, I remember, I remember the, we always laughed about that because that was totally funny. He said, Take the strain! <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, Veronica? Oh, come on, think of some questions, because otherwise um, we have to stop. Go on then, what? Just blank. <laughs> 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 oh, well, let me ask one then. Yeah, are you going to stay in the United Kingdom, or are you going to move again? Because you have this sort of gypsy... I know. I don't know. You're saying so. I don't uh, know. Yes, I do. A mosquito. Yes, mosquito. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I've got this little cottage now, and um, it is, it is heaven. I mean, this is exactly when I decide <coughs> I want to go back to England and I want to have a little cottage and I want to live in the country. I remember when I met up with Debs some years ago, and I said, "Where do you live?" And she said, "In Suffolk." And I got this little thatched roof cottage, and I said, "I want one." 
<laughs> so I've got one, so it's not flat mm. but but um, so now the friends come to stay and they come to see me and um, they say, God, this is so lovely, can't you buy it? And I say, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I couldn't anyway really because nobody would give me a mortgage, I'm told. But, um, but I, I know because I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I have no idea. This is lovely right now. It's just lovely. And, and it's nourishing a part of me that hasn't been nourished for years. So, so it's lovely, but I don't know tomorrow. You always go and come back, don't you? Make up and say, right, it's time to go to Peru now. Got to go to Peru. Is that where you want to go next? Then? Actually, Greece. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't know. Why, don't why, know. why Greece particularly? Yeah. I haven't seen Greece this time around, this lifetime. So I've. Um, this lifetime. This lifetime. It's so interesting. I've, I've got to see it this lifetime phrase. before before I leave. I've got to you see might have seen it in a previous lifetime. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, we've all lived many, many lives. All of us. You know, that's that's just normal. Perhaps it's what caused you to do that painting of that shroud uh, castle with a mist around it. I know, you see, you don't, we do, it's, the whole life is such a mystery. We have no idea what's going on, I tell you. And there's so much more than we actually see, you know. Well, everyone's been to a place they haven't been to before. And they think, oh, hang on a second, this looks familiar. This is very familiar. We've all had that, I'm sure everyone's had that. Deja vu. Yes, and that's kind of weird. Yeah, you it have does, been. It's unsettling, there. isn't it? Mm. No, I love it. <laughs> you, you, you do. I find it unsettling. Uh, I think. Well, well, I have been here before, but I, I know this place. Oh yes, I remember that tree and know it. That, and yeah. just that kind of thing. It's yeah. so strange. Yeah. The familiarity. Any other questions? It's only unsettling if you want to be in control of your life. If you let go of all control, it's such fun. <laughs> uh, perhaps I'm a control freak. I don't, ah. uh, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm just talking about that way. Do you think he is? Anybody know? Am I control? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? 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 Steve, do you have a question? Oh, he's got a question, Steve. Well, we finished already. <laughs> <laughs> We've run out of questions, and otherwise we've got to stop. What acting role would you like to do if you had a choice of something? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I don't know, because um, um, I don't think I particularly want to do any of the. You know, I don't know. It, de it depends what was what would be offered. Who would you like to act with then? Um, Helen Mirren. I think she's smashing. Well, and then never mind all the fellas. <laughs> 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 you know, they're such wonderful, wonderful actors. It, it was interesting because although I left the business, as it were, the business in a way never left me. So that wherever I was in Canada, I would always be watching whatever I could get hold of, of British television or films, you know, because it's the best, you know, it is, it's the best in the world, it just is. And um, so people like John Thor, you know, um, he was in a strange report with me and we were at RADA together, so, so I always felt, it's like I'm watching my mates, you know, um, so, and because I'd known them, I, you know da the actor David Hemmings? Yeah. I always remember him at school. He never used to blow his nose. <laughs> so now I see him and I think, I, you know, I'll be about 11 and I remember you used to have bogeys up your nose. <laughs> you know, these things that you remember about people. But they're all like buddies and so you watch them growing older and it's interesting, you know, and then they all start losing their hair and getting pot bellies. And it's just very, I don't know. It's, so I've never actually left it, you know. Um, and there's part of me, I, it, I just, this happened the other day actually, I suddenly woke up and thought, yes I'm sad actually that I don't act anymore. I went, when I uh, came back to England about two years ago, doing a Doctor Who thing, um, I went to my, I stay with my friend Roger Lloyd Pack, who, used to, who played Trigger in Only Fools and Horses, right? He's my friend, he and his wife are my friends, and I stay with him in London, and I went to his agent. And I said, do you think there's any chance that I might be able to get back into business? And she said, honestly, quite frankly, I wouldn't try if I were you. Because a, a 60s actress trying to get work in the 90s, there's, I can't get work enough for the people I've got on my books. I think you'll find it very hard and a terrible struggle. And you know, if you want to do that, and I thought, eh. <laughs> I don't want to struggle. You know, If it was easy, if somebody handed me a part on a plate, I'd be just thrilled to bits. So I, yes, so I thought the other morning, I thought, yes, I'm sad, because I have a feeling that in me there could have been a tremendous actress, actually. 
But what happened? I don't know. You know, I needed to do other things. You know. And now, in a way, I think it's too late. Um, and partly because I need to live in the country. And I can't live in London. I can't live in London. It's, you know, it's too bad, too noisy, too dirty, too busy. To, um, and also, the business has changed very much from when, like, Mike and I, you know, we were all... In, the business has changed. And um, you need to be... It's frightening because you don't have enough re rehearsal time. You need to be able to remember your lines. And I can't even remember. You do? You know that thing where you put your bank... Go, yes. I was doing... <laughs> I, I, I forgot my number. You know, I can't remember. Yeah, three, three, three times he was saying, pizza, What's your phone number? Yeah. Oh, just a minute. Hang on, I have to find my paper. <laughs> you know, so I don't know about learning, remembering lines, you see. So I don't know. I don't know. I did do some directing in Canada, and I loved yes, that. Yes, you did. You yeah. directed, was it uh, know, Rashomon? Rashomon was, one of the, was the first one. Um, very strong. We had a very strong amateur theatre group there. And they came and said, would you direct a play? And I said, no, I don't direct. I was acting. I don't. And then I had, I got this spiritual thing which says, never say no, you see, just keep saying yes and things open. If you say no, things close. So I heard my no and I said, hang on, I'll change that. Yes, they said, right. So look, you need to choose a play and we're going to have 40 people ready to be cast by Tuesday. And this was like Saturday. So go to the library, find a place. And oh, I was, you know, it was, it, I was heads in. <laughs> what made you choose that particular one? Um, I thought it was going to be easy. <laughs> I went to the library. It's quite complex, isn't it? Oh, bloody hell, I've got to find a play. And I've got to get all these people in. And it should be a very simple set and so on and so on. And I read Rashomon and I thought, I think this is actually quite easy. But as we started work, I thought, I must have been mad. This is the most, you know, complicated and a play with so many shades. But it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Didn't Akira Kurosawa make a film of it? He did. Yes, and it was it was it was very good because it was aspects of the truth. It was um, you get you get these three characters, and each one is telling their story, and each one is is an aspect of the truth, and yet from each story, it's totally different. Um, so that must have been. I mean, directing. I mean, it's, it's a very different thing to acting. You've got all the problems of the production, getting together, casting. Yes. How did you do with that? Well, funny enough, it was like falling off. A Bicycle, or you know, or just climb on a bicycle. You remember, you knew how to ride. Do you know what I mean? Um, working with the actors, I it was it came to me so naturally. I just completely loved it. Besides, I'm terribly bossy, so I love bossing people around. Well, this you is something me, that you get me. <laughs> would you like to sort of pursue that? Do you think? Oh yes, I'd love it. This is what like eight nine years ago you did this, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Well, I know because I thought about it because you know Wimborne, which is near me, they have a they have a they are always asking for directors. The Tivoli Theatre. But I think it, that's right. Yes, I know. That's right. But I then I think I'm going to start working with a whole load of English people. Well, I can't see it somehow. I don't know. I'm not sure. And you didn't get paid. So then, if I'm not going to get paid, I'd rather be painting. <laughs> you know, you know, quite frankly, because it's one thing about it is that it's a tremendous amount of work. And you carry the whole can of it, and you carry the whole. I remember, I remember um, just before, about two weeks before, um, we had this big sign which went across the road saying, you know, the, the Hornby Island Theatre, Islands Trust, Rashomon, and the dates. And I was just feeling sick inside because, because, because the production wasn't, wasn't taking ready. off. It wasn't taking off. These people were still holding back with their. And so, and so what happened was I called a meeting with all the actors and I said, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not prepared to put my name to this in two weeks' time because, you know, you guys, you still, you just are not doing what I need you to do here, you know. Oh, my God. And it was so dangerous because this, this, this group of actors, they could have got up and said, well, you, and, you know, you know. Um, but in fact, they said, okay, all right, all right, we'll pull the hats out, we'll do what we can. And, if, and then we had an incredible production, and we just pulled it together in the last two weeks. You know. I suppose you need to do so, that, but you have to have the courage to do that, know, don't you? I know, because they could have turned around and said, you know, stuff it. <laughs> so that that amount, you know, that amount of sort of um, stress, I'm not sure that I could cope with. I like a nice, peaceful life. Listen, I just do my veg patch <laughs> and paint my paintings and go for nice walks on the downs. That's me. 
I'm getting older. Really. It sounds quite an idyllic lifestyle, actually. I know. Isn't it? I know. The only thing is, I'm totally and utterly skinned. <laughs> well, you see, because the thing, what happened was, um, I left. When I left Canada, I left. I had my reputation there, and you know the exhibitions and things, and and my group of my fan club, my painting fan club and stuff. You see, and I've come back to England, and nobody knows me. So, in in painting terms. So, um, so I'm starting all over again. It must be hard getting an it exhibition is. put on. Yeah. I mean, you've got to get your name around. People have got yeah. to promote your work, I suppose, to a certain degree. And yeah. that, I can see that must be difficult. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a long... And down in Dorset, there are a lot of very good painters. And I'm just one of them, you know, that just sort of arrived, you know, and a lot of them have been there. And so they've got, you know, their people who support them. And I'm new, so it's tough times. And uh, I'm glad I've got, I'm growing my vegetables, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can eat well anyway. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know. Any other so, questions yeah. for Annika? Yeah. We've Silence. Missing episodes at all, we talked about that. Missing episodes. Mm. What did you think of you know, the BBC throwing out all their, oh, like, no. some of their black and white stories? No. Terrible. No, lots of your work. Really, yeah. I mean, you have one story that exists in its entirety for the war machines. So. Well, I, never mind Doctor Who. A lot of my work, you know, was was gone. I mean, I did did do some very good um, dramas and things, and it's all gone. All been wiped. Nothing to be seen. You well, know? the Archer so, Theatre. Yeah. yeah, the Saints yeah. still exist. You did, I think. Yeah, yeah, the early Saints. And the Avengers, actually. They kept those. That's right. You were in the yes. Avengers, weren't you? As well. I know, but those were only tiny parts. You see, I did actually yeah. do some, you know, sonking great things. <coughs> All gone, all wiped. I suppose it, as gone. an actress, it's important to have your work recorded, really, isn't yeah. it? I mean, just for your own sort of well-being. If, if you've done a performance that you're particularly proud of and that's destroyed, I know. there's no record of it. It's no, very sad it's in some respects. I know. So, so I will never be able to see what I did there. And never mind. And as far as Doctor Who is concerned, I can't believe the BBC was so unintelligent not to keep everything. But what about Denzel Washington then? As Doctor Who. As Doctor Who. If it happens. Wouldn't that be fantastic? It's an interesting idea. I certainly. know. I know. Well, I think it's going to happen. I do. I really think they're going to. They're going to have a black actor playing Bond next. I think. I think Pierce Brosnan's doing one more James Bond film after this one. Yeah. I think they're going to cast a black actor in, in that one as well to get a bit more, you know, yeah. dangerous kind of feel to it. Yeah. So he's a great actor, Washington certainly. Yes. He's superb actor. I know. Can they afford him? Does he want an awful lot of money? I don't know. He's, he's a big <laughs> Hollywood star, isn't he? So, yeah. Yeah. if it happens, then but then he would he would bring the he would bring the money in, you see, because he's so he's so big. It'd be very interesting. I wonder what he would do with it. Do you think that a cinema film now is the only way the series can go? I don't know. They try to bring it back as a TV movie. That's a didn't really work. I know. What are they saying? What are they say, What were they saying in that? I read the Independent. Um, article last weekend about it, and what did they say? That um, of course it won't be, you know, it won't have the quality of the of the original series, which, which I mean, the charm of it was the sort of hokiness of it, you know. But um, the writing, the directors, the actors, the production staff, yes, some very good people working on that. Yeah. And I so think. It's, it's interesting because I mean that the Paul McGann's movie really died a death, didn't it? it his performance it, it though was locked. superb. I mean, if you look at his performance, if you look at they had an English director as well. I mean, they had a lot of good things about it, but it was too American. Yeah. You can't. I don't think you can actually do that kind no. of story in no. America. It doesn't work. No. So that then what would happen is that it would become more sort of Star Warsy, you know. Um, so it, it takes it away from, but maybe it, that's what needs to happen. Maybe Doctor Who needs to move into the 20th century. Well, did you, know? you see the comic relief sketch that Ray Anderson did? Did you, did you watch that? Oh, what was that? The case of oh, the birth yes. of death. Oh, yes. No, but it would work like that yes. because it was, it was the, the old crumbly sets again. Yes. Um, perhaps hokey dialogue, maybe, but it, it would have love and care. And people yes. had affection for it. And I think yes. that would work. Yes. That kind of. Um, Almost comedy, really, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, yes. That was that was good, wasn't nice it? Yes, that was good. Jonathan Price is the master. Yes, Jonathan 
Surprise is the most fantastic. The Richard E. Grant. And then the Richard E. Grant. Lick the mirror handsome. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. a great actor, isn't oh, he? Yeah. Yeah. It, it would work. I mean, I think he'd make a brilliant Doctor Who, I think. He would, actually, wouldn't he? He'd be beautiful. He'd be beautiful. Should we write to the BBC? I think so, yeah. Family? Demand Richard E. Grant should be Doctor Who. Yeah. And Jonathan Price should be the master. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Shall we wrap it up? Well, I think, you know... Um, I think that what we don't realise, all of us, is that it, you know that that the, the Doctor Who, the Doctor Who fans, there are so many of us all over the world, that we, we actually have a power and we have a voice. And don't you say that us? You yeah. refer to yourself as a fan oh, as yes, well. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's important, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, okay. You, it, I just think it's it's, it's a series that had a, a lot of care and attention went into it. The money wasn't there, but the writing direction, the acting, the production, they, they did the best of what they had, I think. Yeah. And the fact that we like it so much now shows it, it, was, it was a quality work, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Wills. Thank you very much you indeed. You're very welcome. Thank you. What was next? Do you want to do the photographs outside? or the eat? Um, Yes, I think we'll, we'll do some photographs. Um, it's not about the CDs. Yeah. I beg your pardon. These are Bowman, the CDs you were doing. The audio. Why didn't you ask oh, this question yes. earlier? I just, I just suddenly remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good, yes, it's good. I like this. <laughs> we continue. Switch on. Part two. Part two, the second. Yeah, because uh, I've only seen them on the back of the magazines, but you did have quite a few released. There's a set of three. Yes. I was only in one, I think, or. Yeah. Did I do that? No, you need one. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Master of mind. Actually, it's Chris interesting because, because yeah. although everybody can answer for me always, but it was always very nice with Mike Grace because he would, I would always throw it out to him. He'd say, no, don't. You could we prompt each other. Oh, yeah, you? right. Yeah. Always but in fact, it was lovely. It's always been mm. lovely because I can always say, what, what was the, what did I, what did I do? Mm. Oh, yeah, right. So, yeah, I did one. <laughs> I did one. Mm. And Gary Russell um, directed it. Well, I learned um, you from the days of early fandom because I used to do CTs with him. So ah, old, old, old. oh right. We did it. We yeah. did it this time last year. It was August last year, and again it was a day when it was like 90 degrees outside, yeah. and we were down in this basement of this studio and had no no air conditioning. So we were roasting. We were actually roasting. We had one little fan, and we were sort of moving it around to whoever was looking particularly faint. <laughs> with, you know, we'd shove the fan under their nose. But it was, it was, it was, I loved it, you see, because here I am back again with a script and, uh, and, and I had, to, I had to do a sort of funny voice, or I didn't do, I didn't do it, they made my, the, the lizard woman or something, and the doctor, and, uh, I was the doctor, Dr. Kissinger, and, um, Sophie and, what's her name? Lisa. Lisa. <laughs> yeah, that was lovely, it was good. And, um, I'm going back because they're doing Doctor Who now. Yes, I know. So I know, you see? It's brilliant, you see? So... Uh, it's always that, you know. At least we've got the audio. Yes. I, th I mean, I think, you know, slowly, slowly, the BBC are actually... Oh, there's something in this for us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something they're just, you know... Well, the worldwide yeah. part of the BBC always had been... Uh, anyway, it was the, yes. the actual bosses. And yes. Red tape people. It's always the, the actual so bosses who are, you know... They're always going, oh, sort of... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Always, always been that oh, yeah. way. So, the, the boys in suits. Yeah, boys in suits. Boys the accountants. The accountants. It was the same with um, Strange Report. The boys in suits, the producers, um, they used to come down on the set. They were Americans, and Tony Quayle and I used to laugh because uh, they'd come down on the set. And we'd be, you know, like I said, we'd take the script, we'd hack it to pieces, and then we'd try and do whatever we could to, you know, try and make it a little bit what you see, what you actually see there. Didn't Lou Gray's company make it, though? I think it was new grade, but it was uh, the American producer was called Buzz Berger. I always remember him. <laughs> and um, so they'd come down on the set and they'd watch us work. He was a live producer. Said, oh, the chemistry of this is just so brilliant. This is so brilliant. Oh, this and Tony Quaid used to say, "What? Well, we're making it. Listen, we're doing it. You know? Yeah, yeah. They always used to take the credit as though you know their money was making this happen. I don't know. You, but you were Anthony Quayle's next door neighbour in that, weren't you? you yes. You played to Yes. Well, the doctor didn't do his uh, sleuthing for the police, wasn't he? Yes. 
Yes, it was good, yes. And, uh, and it was a good series because we had, I mean, it was like a sort of um, Kavanaugh or, or Inspector Morse now mm. because we had all the good actors at the time. They'd all come. In fact, John Thor was on the guest stars. Yeah, we had all the good guest stars. We had amazing people. Well, so 15, was, 16 of those, did you? Yeah. So it was lovely working with. And then, interesting, because um, <clears throat> in a way, though, I still was uh, quite, a, quite sort of naive as, of, as an actor. And in one of them, I was working with Herbert Long, who's an old, mm. an old. And Mick said, my husband said to me, I said, oh, you know who's in this one? I said, Herbert Long's going to be in this one. He said, oh, watch him. I said, why? He said, just watch him. He'll upstage you. I said, well, how, how, do, how would he do that? He said, he'll just get upstage. you just watch him. And he started doing it. It was amazing. We'd be having a seat like this, and the camera would be here, and he'd just, he'd just go like this, you see, so that you'd get the back of your head and full face of him. So, I, so it was very funny. So because Mick had warned me, so then, if we'd been standing there, you see, what would happen is the camera is here, we'd be standing talking like this, and then he'd take a step back. So then I'd take a step back. So he'd take a step back, and then I'd take a step back, you see, because I knew what he was doing. And slowly, slowly, we'd been walking up to the end of the set, and they'd say, you guys, can you stop that? Will you come forward? And I'd say, I'm not, I'm just following him, you see. <laughs> <laughs> but these old buggers, they, they learned how to do that. And I mean, I was completely innocent, and I, you know, I didn't... That's a skill you, you pick up, isn't it? Little, little quirks you know, about how to uh, yeah. steal a scene from somebody. I know, steal a scene. You know, and I, I was never interested in doing. I did a, I did a, um, I did a. Uh, I went for an interview when I was quite young, and um, it was to play a sort of double with somebody. And um, I remember walking into this BBC office with the producers and people, and I said, "Let me see the photo of who I'm supposed to look like." You see, and they showed me the photo. And I said, "Oh my." God, you do want me, you want this girl at my school, uh, I've always remembered her name, Anna Castaldini, because she looks exactly like this girl. And I looked at the faces of these grown-ups and thinking, oh, that's weird, because they were all looking at me like I was weird, because I was more concerned that the, the play would be really good than, than me getting yeah, a part. Yeah, I can understand that. Then they all looked a bit shuffly and said, oh, thank you very much, uh, Miss Wills, oh, no. And off I went, and, and Anna got the part, and I said, great, you know, this is good, because it's going to look good. At least your recommendation was taken up. Yeah. They should have given me another part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thanks for that question. It led off into all oh, sorts sorry. of other no, things. That was the PS <laughs> at the end. So, so once again, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to have some photographs for our... Is it too late for a question? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You're talking about the strength of it so much. I never saw it. Yeah, I never saw it. It's well, a great series. Anthony Quayle played Dr. Adam Strange, who basically solved cases that were too baffling for Scotland Yard. He was a criminologist. A criminologist. That's right. Yes. Um, and Annika's character used to live ne next door to Adam Strange, and he used to uh, she used to get uh, whipped up into his stories. Yes, I was the sort of mad painter. It's a bit like a Jason King or Department Test type thing. Oh, yes, I suppose. And he used to Did drive a taxi. He had a taxi. He used to drive London an old cab. taxi, an old London cab. Yeah. I remember in the credit cards, he used to come out of the British Museum or something on a bike, didn't he, on a push bike or something? Um, no, that was. Cars came out of the British Museum, and I was walking along oh, the embankment yeah. looking that's at it. the pavement. That's artists. it, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. artist again, you see. Yeah, it's artist again, I know, you see. It's, it's a series, it, it, I think. Has it been shown on um, satellite at all, Chris? It was on Draft a few years ago, yeah. the old yeah. It's never been repeated on terrestrial television. I think there's a few episodes appeared on video cassette, but they're long out of print now. So I think they said that somebody said that they were going to be rerunning it on some oblique channel in the middle of the night. I oh, don't know. Excellent. Well, we can stop taking it. <laughs> it's a good series, though. Seriously, if you ever get a chance. It was funny how things would turn up in America because um, they were showing it in America. And another time, you see, because when I left the business and after going to India and everything, I was living with this fellow in um, California, and I ha he didn't even know, you know, and then I didn't talk about these things, I'm just in the moment, we're doing what we're doing. And, um, and, then, and then he said, was it, was it true that you um, were on telly and stuff? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he said, well, you know, sort of what sort of things? And then I said, oh, you know, things, I mean, you know, as well as Doctor Who, you know, things like 
you know, sort of the Avengers, actually. And so then, literally, he says, oh, this is the man I'm living with, right? Oh. So then we switch on the television. He said, oh, no, look, this is the Avengers. And I said, yeah, I, I was in this series. And he said, oh, my God, look, there you are. You know? <laughs> I mean, talk about serendipitous, you know, just in that moment, just switching on the telly, which we didn't often watch. Yeah. And there, you know. I think yeah. in America, The Avengers is a very, very big series, yes. though, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's one of the few British series yeah. that really has made its mark over there. Yeah. A great series, of course. I tried to get an agent in California. I went, I went to this mad place, um, American agency, and uh, and so I gave my, you know, my resume thing, you know, you know, you know, Royal Academy and all this stuff. And um, they'd never had anybody like that on their books. They couldn't get me any work. <laughs> they didn't know what to do with me, you know. You know. <laughs> so bugger that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was d I was doing somebody's. Instead of that, I did somebody's garden. I designed this woman's garden for two years. I had this garden was going up a slope, and I did this re redesigned this entire garden. It took me two years. Two years. You're doing one yeah. designing job. Yeah. My oh, goodness. Yeah. I did it. I mean, I I designed it and and did and did the digging, the weeding, the planting, and everything. You know, I mean, I was just doing. I was getting work, whatever work I could do. You know, to keep myself going. Yeah. You obviously like that, though. You like. I mean, you're talking about landscape art. Survival. Turn your hand to anything if you need to, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, you know, and every now and then I'd look up and think. Look at this now. Oh, you know, um, in Canada, they had these. I I was connected with these people who were architects, and they did these amazing houses. And one of the houses that they'd done, they did these sod roofs, which so meant the roof the roof was planted. So the next minute, I'm sitting on the roof of this house, planting little sedums, um, and I look up, and there's this amazing landscape because this house was right out at a peak and. So then you've got this water and the mountains and the eagles and the and the seals in the water and, and so I'm busy the roof, then, planting the roof. I think you, you, know, you never know what kind of a job I'm going to get next or where I'm going to be. You know, yeah, sitting on a roof, weeding. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> Is that it? Finally. Oh, we can go on. Asking time. We don't have to be doing it on this. If you think of something else, you just ask me anyway. All right, switch off. Snip. <laughs> Bye. Fade out. Now we. Oh, uh, we didn't talk about the topic ads. Did anybody ever see the topic ads?